we're here tonight for a presentation with Professor Emerson Tad Baker from uh, Salem State University. He has previously served as a Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate School. He is an award-winning author and co-author of six books on history and archaeology in early New England, including The Storm of Witchcraft, which he's going to be talking about tonight. This is about the Salem Witch Trials and the connections with Salem, Mass, and Massachusetts, and Maine. And it, if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. Um, it is an excellent overview, and it connects us directly with this whole time period and the whole episode of the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, Tad has also served as the chair on Maine Cultural Affairs Council, the Maine Humanities Council, the Maine Historic Preservation Commission, and he has been a consultant on camera and camera expert on historical documentaries and TV shows like PBS and TLC to S Smithsonian the History Channel. And three times on Bill Green's Maine. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You didn't give me that. I know, I didn't tell you that. <laughs> so please welcome oh. Tad Baker. Thank, Thank you, you Sherry. Yeah, and they started running Bill Green's Maine again in the afternoons. You've seen the, the reruns right after the noon news on Channel 6, yeah. Way back to the first season. It's wild. He's young then. Anyhow, it's a pleasure to be here. And really, this, um, you know, I, I really never give the same talk twice on this book because one is because there's so much there, but also, too, because I really like to tailor it to where I am. And frankly, there's no better place for me to talk about it than here because, as Sharon suggested, the, uh, the connections between the Berwicks and Southern Maine more broadly and the Salem Witch Trials is very strong. And uh, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit about maybe what happened in 1692, but also uh, we'll, we'll make sure we get some of those ties in. And you know, I, I, uh, I live in York, another place actually that has a strong association with, uh, with the, the uh, events of 1692. Uh, and coming out tonight, you know, driving through South Berwick and Berwick and driving by some of the sites that were associated with the Salmon Falls raid. And um, it's, it's, I, I just love driving that because to me that that past becomes a lot, particularly on a beautiful fall afternoon. Anyhow, <clears throat> so uh, almost every society has witch hunts. Uh, it really, it's, it's, it's something that seems to be timeless uh, pretty much across all cultures and, and times. And in Europe and your colonies, we have this time period known as the Great Age of Witch Hunts from roughly 1400 to around the time of the American Revolution. And in that time period, about 100,000 people are, are accused and about half of them are executed. And the numbers are big and round and fuzzy because some of these outbreaks are so large we don't have an exact count or a list of names. The, the largest one takes place in Cologne, Germany. It lasts a decade in the 16, 1620s to early 1630s. And about 2,000 people die. Um, and so I emphasize this because I've been teaching at Salem State now and I'm in my 31st year of commuting down from, from Maine. And um, it always struck me, one reason I wrote this book was because I couldn't figure out why Salem was the witch city. And I've been to Cologne, it's got a beautiful cathedral, lovely people. No one mentions witchcraft there. What is it about Salem? Uh, so, uh, uh, and most people say, say well, well, because it was the biggest. Well, no, it, but quite respectfully, by, by European standards, it was just a fly speck. And I say that again with respect, because my, my ninth great uncle, Dr. Roger Toothaker, died in prison while awaiting trial. Um, so I don't mean to minimize the, 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 the tragedy of this, but it just doesn't seem to rate like which city, right? Um, and, and also to people say, well, okay, but it was because Salem was the last. It's like, no. In, in, in Europe, they keep, they, in parts of Europe, they kept on trying and executing witches throughout much of the 18th century. In Hungary alone, about 800 people are executed for witchcraft uh, in the first half of the 18th century. Um, so it's got to be more than that, right? And, and in fact, um, ooh, there we go. Even in New England, people assume somehow, I think, because the Salem is all they've ever heard of, right, that it must have been the only outbreak of witchcraft. Well, no. Um, oh, over 100 people are accused of witchcraft in Salem, in Massachusetts, in, in New England, Massachusetts, and Connecticut principally, before 1692. And in fact, 13 of them are executed. Um, before 1692, and here's a little bit of trivia for you. Actually, before 1692, there had been more witches executed in Connecticut than Massachusetts. See. Um, so, um, 
They are different though, fundamentally different. And almost all of these cases, except for uh, a, 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 a smaller outbreak of maybe eight or 10 people in Hartford in the 1660s, almost all of these are one or two or at most three people. So there is something very fundamentally different about, about Salem and, and what happened there. And I think that's, that's part of it. Um, I have to mention one other typical, well, unusual, but really more typical case of witchcraft uh, that is also set in Berwick. And that is 10 years before the Salem Witch Trials in 1682, um, George and Alice Walton, who were Quakers who live on Great Island, present day Newcastle, New Hampshire, um, they run a, a diverse and debauched tavern. Um, now, and, and, now, and it's supernaturally assaulted with flying stones throughout the summer of 1682. Now, I'm not making this up, right? There, there were, whether they were supernaturally assaulted or not, but there, certainly their tavern was pelted for months on end, uh, and they, they accused their widowed elderly Anglican neighbor of being a witch, and she cross-accuses George of being a wizard. Now, notice this, none of this is ever in your history books, right? I mean, did I ever, here we go, we've got this case of witchcraft involving Quakers and Anglicans, and again, debauched taverns um, with Native American household servants and Ir I Irish servants and stuff like this. Very different place than we think of when we think of Puritan New England, right? Well, that's a whole nother talk, but point is like, Puritan New England really, really wasn't quite so much, particularly up here in Northern New England. Um, so, fascinating thing about this case uh, again, it's sort of this more typical witchcraft case because witches could do all kinds of things. You know, we have this idea of spectral affliction with a girl writhing on the floor from Salem, but having more of like a poltergeist attack of a stone-throwing demon was actually more common uh, in, than you'd, you'd believe back then. This is a really interesting case to me because it's the lithobolia attack, which means for Greek for stone thrower. And this is, there were two accounts written about this in the 1680s. It was fairly famous. Um, it actually spreads upriver, right? It starts off down here on Great Island, and then in by within a month or so, by midsummer, there's a case right here in Berwick, in what present day South Berwick, and actually in Berwick where the people lived. And it's an interesting household, because again, it's not your typical Puritan New England household. It's uh, Antonio Hortado, who's a sailor from Fayol in the Azores, he's Portuguese, and his wife Mary is the daughter, of, she's an Anglican daughter of a, of a, of a York fisherman. Um, and um, when they, they marry, they live up here because they did, didn't, were pretty poor folk and they didn't have, actually didn't have land. They lived probably somewhere on, um, on the Worcester's property, somewhere near Worcester, Worcester's Brook, right? Um, because her sister was married to a Worcester. And I haven't been able to figure out exactly where they live because they never owned land. That's how poor they were. Uh, and also because they, they meet an untimely end, which I'll get to. Um, so sure enough, all of a sudden, Mary walks out of the house one morning and she's got this huge welt over her eye. She has bite marks on her arms, scratch marks on her, on her upper chest or breasts. And they say, Mary, what happened to you? And uh, she doesn't say what we're thinking is that her husband's abusing her. He says, what a typical abuse victim would say is like, oh, well, you know, I don't know. It was, it was uh, oh yeah, it was that stone throwing demon, you know, that down, you heard about that? Well, that's what happened to me too, you know. It wasn't my husband, you know, I'm, wow. Anyhow, it's, so I write a lot about this action in the, in, uh, in, in the Devil of Great Island. Um, but to me, it's...
and have students talk about it. I um, mean, we read a whole bunch of books and try to sort it out. Um, but I call it a storm of witchcraft because I really feel, I, I really equate it to that other great Essex County tragedy, you know, the, the, the loss of the fishing fleet and the perfect storm, right? Um, that it really takes a huge convergence of bad things to all happen at once to create some misery on this large scale, uh, com really compared to anything else. So um, I talk about a lot about these different factors in the book, but longstanding factionalism in Salem Village is a whole really wonderful book written on this, the first modern history of the Salem Witch Trials written by Boyer and Nissenbaum in 1974 called Salem Possessed. And it looks just in the factionalism inside Salem Village. Present day Danvers, by the way, right? It was stillborn kind of community that wasn't allowed to break off from Salem, but was allowed to hire their own minister. And it's it just, they don't have political autonomy and they don't have the power to make decisions and it becomes a mess. Um, by 1692, they were on their fourth minister in 20 years. And usually when you get a hold of a minister, hire them out of college and they stay there the rest of their lives. There was just a lot of acrimony of neighbor against neighbor, brother against brother, uh, arguing over politics and religion. It was not good at all. Um, and on top of that, at the time you have political uh, instability throughout the colony. Uh, Massachusetts lost its original charter of 1629 and 1684. It's revoked by the crown. They send, send over Colonel Edmund Andros, this English military colonel, army colonel who runs almost a dictatorship and takes away the liberties of, of the of Puritan ma folks in Massachusetts and actually um, deprives them of the unique status of the Puritan church. Um, funny, we, we tend to think of the Puritans being all about democracy. Well, they really weren't. They were all about freedom of religion for themselves. But by their charter, Puritanism was the only w worship that was allowed in the colony. So when Edmund Andrews came in and said, no, we have to let the, the Baptists and the Quakers and the Church of England worship as well, the Puritans were just, they just, were horrified. This was the end for them, really. I mean, it was, it's almost laughable, right, you know? Um, but it really was not. This is very serious to them. Um, to, they, they end up overthrowing Andros in 1689, and there's an interim government. And then in January 1692, um, they, hear, they get word that a new governor and a new charter is coming uh, in, in, in this, in, uh, and is leaving England, and the charter has big changes because it's going to make all the laws. They have to re change the laws and start them again. And uh, it also is a royal, the governor will be a royal appointee. And he's going to be this guy, William Phipps, this treasure hunter from Maine, this guy who's, who, well, he's a character. I wrote a, I co-authored a biography of him, and there's another whole talk on Phipps. But anyhow, um, you also have the perceived decline of, decline of Puritanism. You know, whatever people say about witchcraft and neighborly tensions and things. Witchcraft is a religious crime, and it takes place among societies where people are worried about the declining religious fervor in their community. Now, the fact that see, people were so wound up about this in Massachusetts probably tells you it hadn't declined very much, but church attendance was down, membership was down, and again, people who were feeling like their special relationship, their special covenant with God, between God and the Puritans, was in danger and that God was terribly angry, and he was going to send Satan in as a, as a test for people of Massachusetts. Um, and also, too, in the 17th century, to everybody, in the age really before science, everything was a sign of God's pleasure or displeasure. You know, beautiful sunsets, wonderful fall foliage, great weather, bumper crops. God's mercy is upon us, God's blessings upon us. Um, oh, things like comets, things, things like northern lights that they couldn't explain, God's anger. So, but also, too, how about the worst weather in known history, right? Massachusetts and Northern Europe and New England in the late 17th century were in the worst, we now know, or in the absolute worst years of what we now know as the Little Ice Age. Um, it, was, it was horrifically cold temperatures. I mean, two or three hundred years worst weather we now know, right? And um, the frost would last until April or May or June, and then you'd have a hot, dry summer that would kill what anything left you planted and then the frost would start again in August and then you'd have horrific winters. Remember that winter about 10 years ago where every Monday we had about another foot or two of snow? That's what they had back then. And so uh, it, this is, destroys the economy, destroys crops, causes, causes starvation, causes inflation, all those bad things. Um, and um, we know actually Wolfgang Berenger, really good wolf, European uh, wolf witchcraft historian and also weather historian, points out that when you have bad weather and also a weak government that you're worried about, both happen in a pre-modern society, that's when people start accusing other people of witchcraft. People can handle bad weather and starvation if they know 
the government has their their back and they have a good government that's going to provide for the people in need. But if you don't trust the government, uh, all bets are off and people start accusing everyone else of witchcraft. Um, so not surprised. And add on top of that another worst sign, military disaster, King William's War, that war that literally destroyed Berwick and what's now Berwick and South Berwick and, and, and most of Maine. Um, the war starts in 1688, it lasts till 1697 and much of the action takes place down here. Um, Salem's down here and if you look we have uh, this whole area here that's raided really from Fort Loyal and Falmouth, what was then Falmouth, what we now call Portland and, F and Fort Loyal was really in downtown Portland um, uh, at the foot of India Street. And Major raid, uh, raids there and on Salmon Falls in, in the Berwicks in March of 1690. York is destroyed in a raid in 1692 and actually the minister is killed on that raid. And these are some of the largest raids between Native Americans Euro and Europeans uh, in, this, in this era. And I, I don't mean to pick on the Native Americans by any stretch here. Um, and, and this is, these were horrible eras of war. Uh, there were for, for every English village that was destroyed, there was an English militia group that would march up to Norwich or some of their Native American fort and village and, and, and indiscriminately kill everybody. Um, it, there were no non-combatants -combat and the Native Americans had really good reason to be on the warpath and uh, it's, it's just a horrible time. Um, but but to, to the New Englanders, you see, this is perceived also too, not just as a military disaster um, and an economic disaster, uh, where it looks like New England's being abandoned. It's to the stage where by 1692, every settlement pretty much north of York has been abandoned, and even York has just been almost annihilated. Um, and uh, everything, all the settlements all the way up from like Pemaquid to, to here are just gone, right? And this whole, the, the whole frontier is like rolled back. Everyone's left the Berwicks and is back down in like Elliot. Um, so it's, 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 it's a horrible time. Um, and particularly the Salmon Falls raid, March 18, 1690. Um, a combined French and native force, because in this, in this war, the, the Wabanaki have uh, their, their allies, the French of, of Acadia and Quebec. And, um, and they, uh, a combined force, just again, just decimates uh, the Salmon Falls, really staying on, on the main side of the river. And they come down river starting up here, and they literally burn, take captive, kill everybody through from, from the edges of Berwick all the way all the way, uh, well, from up here, from Worcester's Brook is where the settlement started, then really, all the way down, uh, really, uh, down really to like the Great Works. Everything north of that is, 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 is just gone. And people are holed up in their garrison houses if they make it. Dozens of people are taken captive to, to Quebec. Some of them are up there four or five years or longer. Um, and, and some never return. Um, just, you know, just again, just a, a, real, a real tragedy. Um, about 80 taken captive, uh, uh, killed or took out about 80 people, including Mercy Short, who's maybe the most famous 17th century resident of Berwick, who we'll come back to. And she, let's see, she lives right there. So there's uh, New Dam Road and a, a bit south of there. Um, I've always, I've been looking for the site. It's got to be out there somewhere. Uh, and then further down river also too, sawmills are destroyed. In this case, the, 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 the sawmill uh, owned by um, uh, the Hull family and actually their son-in-law, Samuel Sewell, who, yes, will be a future witchcraft judge. It's destroyed and he estimates the loss in modern terms would be about a, a million or multi-million dollar loss. Um, so pretty rough times, right? Um, and we'll talk more about this. Um, so that's certainly a factor. And in fact, we, you know, one of the questions is what, I want to know is what caused the afflictions, what caused the accusations. And again, while it's really a long and complicated story, um, no real simple answers. I, I do like I had to put a pitch in there. My favorite depiction of 17th century New England as far as historically accurate and also of witchcraft, the movie The Witch. It's kind of a scary movie. I don't like horror movies, but it's more, more, more just sort of tense drama with a little bit of gore, but not a lot. And I actually had the chance to meet Rob, Robert Eggers uh, when they did a, a world pre-premiere in Salem the night before the world premiere. So I got to meet him and hang with him and the, then the young charming ingenue Anya Taylor-Joy who was delightful. Um, and uh, yes, I have the photographs to prove it. Um, and then actually I, we did a panel discussion and if you get the DVD, I'm on the, the deluxe DVD with the Salem panel discussion, but anyhow. Um, but so what's going on here? Well, first off, one of these factors clearly is, again, there's no single answer as to what caused people to be accused or afflicted. 
But certainly one fact was the war. There is a war panic, a war hysteria taking place here. Uh, over 40 people in the Salem witch trials had ties to Maine, had formerly lived here and were war refugees, had relatives who had been killed here, had family members who were serving in the militia here, uh, some even who were, who were, were wounded or, or killed. Um, and even, of course, even got the governor, Sir William Phipps, is from Woolwich, Maine, originally, right? Um, afflicted girls, Sarah Churchwell, Abigail Hobbs, Mercy Lewis, Mercy Short, others were refugees from Maine. Um, Reverend George Burroughs and Ann Predator, who were both executed, were former Maine residents. Burroughs was taken in chains back from Wells, where he was minister. He'd previously been minister in Falmouth, and a couple months before the attack there that destroyed Falmouth, he moved to Wells in the spring of 1690. And um, miraculously, he escaped. He survived that, right? People go, how did you know to survive that? You know, did your buddy Satan tip you off? Really, this is what people began to wonder about Burroughs. Um, we have some people around here who were accused, uh, Mariners Nicholas Frost of, of Frost Hill, right? And uh, Judge, Judge Corwin, Haythorn, Gedney, and Sewell, four of them all owned sawmills in Maine that had been just destroyed. So four of the nine Salem witch trials judges had, were, had basically lost fortunes because of this, this war. Uh, now this pattern isn't a coincidence. And again, it, it talks about a lot of war hysteria and panic and also loss of cases of PTSD. I think everybody who lived through this time in Maine in particular had probably had PTSD the rest of their lives. Right. Um, so that's one problem, an, an issue. Another one is, is, is conversion disorder. Uh, and in this case, a, a case of mass conversion disorder. Conversion disorder is a funny thing. And again, I don't pretend to be a, a clinical psychiatrist. And I know this is controversial st stuff to diagnose today, so let alone even when the patients have been dead 300 years. Um, but it seems pretty clear, looking at the, 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 ex what happened, that um, some of the, the first to, to become afflicted in, in Salem Village are, are suffering from conversion disorder. Conversion disorder is, is, a, is, a, is a mental illness where um, you literally are in such anguish and pain and suffering and, and fear, panic, anxiety, that your mind takes over. And your mind being really smart doesn't even bother to tell you what it's doing, but it starts behaving in crazy ways. You feel like you're being stuck with a thousand needles. You temporarily go blind or lose your ability to speak. Um, you throw yourself on the floor and start barking like a dog. You want to throw yourself into the roaring fire in the fireplace. This is not acting out. You don't know why you're doing this. You're terrified. You know what's causing it. And that just makes it worse, right? That just makes the panic, the anxiety all worse. Um, and um, it's, an, it's, an, it's an interesting thing because um, it, it is target population we know from modern studies, and I talk about this in the book. There was a case about a decade ago in Leroy, New York, a famous case. And uh, there is in other cases in modern America, um, it's largely a teenage affliction, which again, okay, I have two daughters who are pretty healthy and well-adjusted who made it into their 30s. I'm, their 30s, I'm very proud of them. But, you know, it's, it's not easy on our kids these days, you know? I, I tell this as a college professor, I got a bunch of 18-year-olds now that, you know, um, it's hard. I mean, in this case, they've suffered through COVID, but man, that was, life was easy compared to being uh, in the 17th century New England with this sort of stuff going on, and particularly too for women. And again, I think our, our young women today have it very tough growing up. But again, in Puritan, a patriarchal Puritan society where women have almost no legal rights, where children, are men, boys and girls are meant to be seen and not heard, where physical violence was more or less encouraged within reason, um, this was very difficult life, and especially very hierarchical structured society too. Children are at the bottom of the pecking order um, for, for sure. Um, so imagine what that life was like. Um, and, and imagine, you know, how, how te young, you know, uh, adolescent girls, I, that can be a huge problem. And who were the first to be afflicted uh, in, in Leroy, New York? Uh, it's the cheerleaders, the high school. This turns out to be something, when you have a case of mass conversion disorder, when you have the cheerleaders, and again, they're not faking. They're not acting out. They don't know why they're doing it. But they start doing it, and then all of a sudden, by the power of suggestion, their friends do it as well, too, because the cheerleaders, you know, they're sort of at the so top of the social pecking order in the high school. Salem Village, it's the daughter and niece of the minister, um, Betty Paris and, and her, her cousin, uh, Abigail Williams. And uh, as, the, as the daughter and niece of the minister, they're at the top of the social pyramid for children in Salem Village. 
Why are they? Why are? Why would they be having suffering from conversion disorder? Because their father, or father figure, Reverend Samuel Paris, is the minister in Salem Village, and he has lost control over the local committee that sort of is responsible for paying the minister. His enemies have taken over in the fall of 1691. They can't really fire him, but they, but they agree to stop paying him and collecting the money and to collecting the firewood that he's owed to. So here, and he's decided that it, this Satan is testing him and he's not gonna leave like his predecessors. George Burroughs just got up and went back to Maine. He said, okay, you guys are gonna pay me, I can get a hint. Paris, no. He sees this as Satan is at war with him, and he's not going to let it happen. And clearly his enemies must be in league with Satan. And he starts these fire and brimstone warlike sermons. And, and he, can you imagine, he's, he's sitting in, in, in his, his study in, in the second room of, of his house, of the parsonage, and he's belting out these sermons as he's practicing them. And it's probably cold, because there's not enough firewood. It's prob the girls are probably hungry. And they're terrified because Dad is freaking out and saying, God is coming, and we're all going to pay the price. He didn't, I don't, again, I don't think, did he mean to do this? No. Was he, was he, did he have strong parenting skills? No. Was he a good in being a, parishion, a parishioner of his flock, of, of a, uh, you know, looking after them? He had no pastoral skills whatsoever, I don't think, unfortunately, you know. Uh, so I don't, I, I don't think any, any, he did anything deliberately. I just think he was just, he was out of his depth, it, sadly. And the results were, there was, the fact is once Betty, Betty and Abigail get this, others get this. So I think that explains some of it. I think things like PTSD explain some of it. And I also think it's, again, it's pointed to get back to the issue of, of these, these aff the afflicted girls who were really a group of eight or ten um, young women, basically between the ages of about 12 and 20. Um, witchcraft is a gendered crime. Throughout time, throughout place, about 75% of, of, the, of the people who are accused of witchcraft are women. And again, in pre-modern societies in particular, tend to be patriarchal, tend to be male-dominated uh, in many cases. And um, so women are looked at in, in Puritan society, you know, as the weaker vessel made from Adam's rib. And, uh, and again, it, I hate to say such things, being, having a wonderful wife and two amazing daughters, but back then it was like, you know, well, clearly you're inferior, aren't you? You know, you're more susceptible to Satan's wiles. He'll be able to trick you, but not me, because I'm a man. It's like, oh, really? Um, that was the thinking, right? And that's why women tended to be accused. Um, and, but, and, and even, it's even worse than that because witchcraft was believed to travel through families. So, if your wife is accused, your children and you may be accused as well, and other members of the family, maybe her sister or her brother, you see. Um, so, the men who were accused were also often relatives, and also too, uh, historically, men who dared to stand up for either their wives or their neighbors the women who were accused, they were more likely to be accused as well too because, wow, you seem like a good God-fearing Christian, but now you're defending a witch. Why would you do that? What's that say about you? Um, and in fact, the bravest people in Salem, I think, were those who would stand up for their, their neighbors like that and, and sign petitions saying, no, you know, they may not be my best buds and I may disagree with them politically, but Rebecca Nurse is not a witch. She's a God-fearing Christian woman, very charitable, beloved by the community. What are you, for, you guys, what are you thinking? Um, anyhow, so um, also too in these afflicted girls, we have a couple of, of, of mothers, women of around 40 years of age. We also have a Native American um, male who's actually, um, Titaba and John are both Native Americans who were enslaved by the Paris family. And also Judge Corwin, who's one of the witchcraft judges, his own son is afflicted. By the, oh, you know, they had no conflict of interest laws in the 17th century. Uh, it's English justice as we would think of it with some changes, but there are a few things like that that really puzzle you, like, really? Wow. Um, anyhow, um, and also too, by the way, you have these, so you have these, uh, these afflicted girls for a variety of reasons, but you even have other people accusing people of, um, they afflicted me, you know, um, they caused lightning to strike my house, they caused my, my cow to die, my crops to fail. Um, they, they had poppets, that is image magic voodoo dolls uh, that they're using against me, all these kinds of things. So there's a lot more in those 900 pages. And by the way, Google the University of Virginia's website on the Salem Witch Trials, just UVA Salem Witch Trials, and you can look at the transcribed testimony. There's over 900 documents, and you can read all about it case by case. Um, but traditionally, so Salem gets out of hand, and traditionally in most witchcraft accusations, it's, it's kind of like Casablanca. Okay, round up the usual suspects. Normally, witchcraft is a working class crime. It takes place amongst people on the wrong side of the tracks, you know, just sort of cursing each other and, no, you're a witch, no, you're a witch, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, 
And if you look at the first three people accused, Tereba, enslaved Native American owned by Reverend Paris, Sarah Good, um, actually from a well-to-do family, but she, she, uh, she, she falls on hard times. She, her first husband dies in debt. The sec she marries again, and they inherit the debt. They're wandering paupers, uh, going around begging, living in, sleeping in people's barns, and she's also apparently distempered. Um, and Sarah Osborne, um, a, a respectable, well, to a point, a respectable woman of Salem Village. Um, but her husband dies, and at that point, she makes the bad judgment of marrying her indentured, her young Irish indentured servant, freeing him and then marrying him. Just scandalize the neighborhood. So you see people who are social outcasts like, like Tedaba or, you know, scandalized like Sarah Osborne or, you know, distempered, suffering from mental illness like Sarah Good. These are the typical people accused of witchcraft. And normally it would end like this. It would have, but in this case, it, it, it doesn't for, for a lot of reasons. And over time, the accusations spread onward and upward. And that's because by the, by the spring of 1692, people are convinced that witchcraft is loose in the community. And um, they, they know they need to do something to stop it. And when they bring in uh, these three, and Tituba confesses, Probably after Reverend Paris beats her, the first day of testimony she doesn't confess, but the next day she comes back with, you know, scrapes and marks on her arms that she says, you know, Satan did to her. And I'm thinking, yes, oh, you mean Satan, Re Reverend Paris? Probably, right? She, in she ends up confessing to witchcraft. And she, she, she gives truth to the lie of a satanic conspiracy because they say, okay, okay. So you signed Satan's book, right? Well, yeah. Well, okay. How many other names did you see? Well, there were nine in all. You know, there was, well, who were they? Well, I don't know. I mean, I want me and Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne. Uh, okay, okay, who else? Well, I don't know. It was dark, and uh, some guy flew in from Boston, but he had his hat down, though. I didn't quite catch his name, didn't really see, you know. But this is how they do this. They, basically, it's like your best crime shows where they, you know, bring in one of the small fish and then, you know, get him to flip and, and confess and then they go after Mr. or Mrs. Big, right? You know, lo love, uh, love, love wa watching, the, like the closer in particular, where you see, by means kind of fair or, or kind of foul, because you know it's to a noble cause. And that's really what happened in 1692. Well, yes, there were even cases where they used mild judicial torture to in, 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 encourage people to tell the truth, or that is to confess whether it was the truth or not. Um, so, and, 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 in, and so, you know, in Salem, that's when the fear and pain it grows. And by the end, the governor's wife is cried out upon as being a witch, right? Um, members of the general court, the legislature, are cried out upon as being a witch. Ministers, George Burroughs, the minister for Maine, is executed for witchcraft. Puritan minister, Harvard graduate. Um, so it, this is what happens when you have a witch hunt, folks. Anybody is fair game after a while. Uh, and that's where it got scary. Um, well, that's not working right, is it? There we go. All right. So... These afflicted girls in the center of this controversy live really difficult lives. Most of them, as I say, are like late teens. Many of them are serving girls. Again, at the bottom of the pecking order, many of them are war refugees. Some are orphans who or lost parents or other family members in the war. And one of my favorite examples of this, I, 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 I have to talk about it this time today, is Mercy Short, because she was from Berwick, right? And um, she was taken captive on the Salmon Falls raid. Uh, it has a hor horrific uh, experience, and um, um, well, I'll, I'll come back and talk more about her, but uh, keep that in mind, because uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story. Well, say, she, um, she's taken to Quebec, she's ransomed, she comes back, and then she describes ba Satan as a black man or tawny like an Indian, and she's re reliving that PTSD, that day when her life changed when the raid came and killed mu most of her, much of her family. Uh, PTSD. There was definitely some ver verbal and physical abuse by these, by the, I'm sure, by these, these uh, serving girls. Again, sometimes because it's like, you know, if your servant's not acting right, it's okay to cuff them around. Um, certainly verbal and physical abuse. And sexual abuse, I think, is even a possibility. I think there was, may have been something going on between John Proctor and Mary Warren. Um, makes me wonder. Can't prove it, but something probably going on there. Um, and here is what inter is interesting. So in 1692, what makes the Salem witch trial so unusual is this, the evidence of spectral evidence. That is, um, someone says that the invisible specter uh, of, of George Burroughs or John Willard is afflicting them. And no one else can see, only the person being afflicted. 
Now, to us, that sounds crazy. It's not crazy in 1692 because witches and the devil can, can create specters to harm people. The real question that some people had was like, well, yeah, but Satan's a great trickster. Couldn't he just be using someone else's specter that's an innocent person to harm you? And then you get a twofer. You get to afflict someone, and you also get someone accused of witchcraft who's innocent. Um, anyhow, um, but if you look at these guys, like John Willard was, was a known wife beater, if you look at the testimony, or George Burroughs, whose wives' ghosts appear to the afflicted girls and say, he killed us. Well, people died back then, especially women in childbirth, you know? It was not unusual, unfortunately. Poor guy. But he's also known for his tremendous strength and his secretive, controlling ways over his wives. You're like, oh, okay, George. Um, so, th you know, you, you have these, these, these kinds of issues going on, uh, and particularly in, in George Burroughs, who, uh, I mean, George Jacobs, who's hanged on August 19, 1692. 83 years old when he's hanged. He's walking around with the help of two canes, and here they are in the Peabody Essex Museum. Um, and his serving girl, Sarah Churchwell, claims that Jacob Spector is using his canes to beat her. Notice, it, she doesn't feel appropriate saying that his, he actually beats her, right? But, oh, it's his Spector doing this to her. Um, it's always the specters that are of, of these masters that are harming the girls. Uh, again, I think so. I think there's, this is their way of trying to, trying to get out of that, that, that abuse, right? Um, interesting thing, though, about Sarah Church, Churchwell. She's born in Saco. She's actually the, grand, the granddaughter of John Bonathan, the proprietor of Saco. Um, and the family moves to Marblehead after they're forced out in King Philip's War, the nasty war before between the Native Americans and the English before King William's War. And they live in Marblehead, but again, the, the family has lost pretty much everything. They've been burnt out. And she's a lowly house servant uh, in, in, for, for, for the Jacobs family. Um, by the way, after she, she, like most of the afflicted girls, seemed to survive, as far as we can tell, relatively unscathed. But one wonders about the psychological damage of being involved in the witch trials. But she survives, actually, and in 1709, she marries uh, Edward Andros, who's a, a weaver in Berwick, Maine, lives near the s South Berwick Elliott border. Um, and so she lived her life, the rest of her life here in relative anonymity. We don't even know where she's buried, but I'm almost certain that she's probably buried down in the, one of the cemeteries down in the southern end of, uh, of, of South Berwick, or maybe over the Elliott line. Um, so again, just another connection between the Berwicks, and here we have one of the afflicted who's from Saco and ends up uh, living and dying here. But, but Mercy Short, listen to the testimony of Mercy Short. Had been taken captive by our cruel and bloody Indians in the East. This is Cotton Mather, one of the leading ministers of Boston, um, when Mercy becomes afflicted, uh, she is taken captive. She's redeemed back to Boston. She's, her family's largely gone, and she's the lowly servant of a wealthy woman in Boston. And when the, 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 her mistress asked her to, to uh, go to the Boston jail and deliver a meal to a friend who'd been accused of witchcraft, uh, Sarah Good actually curses Mercy when Mercy refuses to give her some tobacco, uh, apparently. And, and Mercy literally just literally freaks out. That's it. She becomes afflicted. I mean, again, probably PTSD just hitting home really hard. And, you know, she, because, and they basically say, right, um, this is the Salmon Falls raid Mather's describing. Um, the Indians in the East who horribly butchered her father, her mother, her brother, her sister, and others of her kindred, and then carried her and three surviving brothers with two sisters from New Echewanica to Canada. Again, she's reliving those moments um, when she's, uh, she's afflicted and is really sort of PTSD. And again, she describes, the, she describes Satan. When Satan comes to tempt her, he was not of a Negro, but of a Tawny or Indian color. He wore a high-crowned hat with straight hair. Sounds like a Wabnaki to me, what she's describing here, right? Um, and again, she's just reliving that. But of course, <laughs> this one had a cloven foot, right? Satan. She's seeing Satan. She's seeing those Native Americans who just destroyed her life as, 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 as being Satan. Um, so conversion, PTSD, abuse, war hysteria, all of the stuff's going on. But, but clearly, too, also, yes, there is some fakery going on. Hard to say how much. I tend to actually be on the grounds of probably not that much. Because for these girls, if they're in their sound mind, at least, to accuse someone of witchcraft, no, um, you know, you are going to be eternally damned in the fires of hell for doing that. Any Puritan would have thought that. So why on earth would a teenager do that? You know, why would anybody do that, right? I, but if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if there are mental, societal, other things going on, physical ailments, maybe that leads you to do that. Um, but I think the one basic agreement by the stories is, well, to what degree? How much does this account for? Because there clearly was some fraudulent behavior. But particularly to think about this, after Bridget Bishop is executed on June 10th, the first person executed, that bridge has been crossed. You can't say, 
oh wow, whatever was bothering me, I'm better now. I don't know if, I don't know if it was the mushrooms on the pizza or what, but uh, wow, so how's Bridget? Oh, she's dead. Okay, wow. You know, seriously, you cannot turn back. You, you are in the game now. You have to, you have, if you, you come to say, and Mary Warren actually in May had, had tried to switch sides. She said, wow, she literally said that like a, I don't know what's going on. I'm feeling better now. I, I don't know what I was saying. But those girls over there, the afflicted, they're dissembling. And dissembling is a really interesting word in the 17th century because it means not telling the truth, but it could mean either uh, deliberately lying, even like maliciously lying, or it could mean like they don't know they're not telling the truth, but it's not the truth. Um, in the end, they start accusing her of being a witch, so she ends up deciding that she's better off becoming afflicted again. Um, so again, but from that point on, probably Mary Warren's probably making it all, all up to go along with the gang, because otherwise she was going to be uh, a victim as well. Um, but no, <laughs> ergot poisoning has nothing to do with it, or okay, maybe one or two people. But you know, this is this idea that there's a, the rye that these people harvested to make their bread out of. If you're storing it and it gets mold, if it gets damp, a mold will grow on it, and that mold, yes, literally produces LSD. Um, and um, if you ingest that bread with the LSG on it, it's also the, er it's, it's, the ergot that forms the LSD is also a poison. And it's slowly poisoning you to death. And um, there's a couple different types of, 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 of ergot, but the one that has the hallucinogenic side effects, um, yeah, well, if you are poisoned by that, like most cases of poison, you just get steadily worse and worse and worse. Uh, and eventually you get gangrene and your limbs shrivel, blacken, and fall off, you die. Nothing like that's described in 1692. And as I said, I think all but one of the afflicted girls seems to have lived relatively long lives. Um, and, and instead, I would like to point out that this is first, interpretation was first suggested in 1970 during the Timothy Leary days and the hippie dippy days. Um, and it was put down by scholars within about six months, but I, I, it's, it's like trying to kill a vampire it just, or a werewolf. It just has more lives. Uh, you, you can't stop it. And every TV show wants to have a new idea. So it must be ergot. I think to some degree people like it too because we, we're looking for simple answers. You know, magic bullets or one pill that makes us healthy, that kind of stuff. Can we just explain really big mysteries with, oh, it's just ergot. Oh, sorry, it wasn't, because uh, it doesn't make sense. But also, too, um, it doesn't make sense, because think about this. Why was it only at most one or two people in any given house? I mean, they're all eating from the same bread, right? Um, and why is it that you, that you have some afflicted in Salem Village, in Andover? There were more people accused of witchcraft in Andover than Salem. It should be the Andover witch trials by all rights. Um, or even uh, in Boston. Right? So it doesn't make sense in, in many ways. It, okay, is it possible that one or two people had that or something else or some other medical ailment? Yes, because there are lots of different symptoms, right? But I can tell you one thing. The afflicted girls will seem relatively normal, and then when one of the uh, accused witches comes into the courtroom, they start becoming afflicted. As soon as they leave, they're back to normal. That is not a normal disease process by any stretch of the imagination. Well, but, but it was, okay, then it was because they were taking their neighbor's land, they were accusing them of witchcraft. Nope, sorry. Uh, in 1692, the one time in, 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 in uh, Massachusetts history because of them trying to create these new laws, yes, it was true that um, a convicted felon lost their personal property. That is clothes, furniture, livestock, uh, ox carts, stuff like that. But your real estate, your land, your house, passed to your ears, even if you were convicted and executed for the most heinous crime. Well, which actually would have been witchcraft right back then, really. Um, so that doesn't explain it, um, except for the fact that the government, people sort of, there's a grain of truth here, right, as there always is with these things. Um, so the, the government did take your property, right, your clothing, etc., cetera, um, and they profited. And so it's like April 15th, it's always the federal government that wins, right? It was always the king. This went to the crown, and no, there were no finder's fees. So, no, people weren't doing it. Now, having said that, that isn't to say that some people weren't accusing their neighbors or because of these tensions. They're certainly true. But it wasn't like, oh, if I accuse that, then I'll get a really nice farm. It never, it never worked that way. Uh, and there are really no examples of that ever happening. Um, so, it wasn't for that either. And uh, so, yeah. Lots of those things that it's not, right? Uh, no, it wasn't Lyme disease either. One of my students actually wrote a book on that uh, and other things. But again, 
or encephalitis, another one. But could it have been one or two people? Sure. Um, my book, that where I explore this, there are a lot of really good books on the witch trials. Um, the one that I, where I focus in on uh, that other people really hadn't as much, I think, is the legal system. I talk about the frontier and the connections, too, but also the legal system and the judges. Because, you know, in an English legal process where you, where you have grand juries, you have trial juries, you have all those trappings of English law, you have testimony and witnesses and sworn evidence, um, juries can make bad verdicts, but it takes judges to go along with them and then to sign a death warrant. So I really wanted to look at the judges. Um, and from the beginning, it's clear that the judges here, this panel of nine judges, are convinced that Satan is in their colony and their job is to round up the witches and to execute them, okay? So on the first day of questioning, when Judge Haythorne and Corwin in, uh, interview, in, interrogate Sarah Good, look at the first questions they ask. What evil spirit have you familiarity with? Have you made no con compact with the devil? Why do you hurt these children? He might as well ask, when did you stop beating your husband, right? Leading questions. English judges normally didn't behave this way uh, in, in, in Massachusetts. Um, they, none of them were lawyers by training, but all of them were educated men and who'd served in other trials before, including other witch trials where people weren't convicted, in fact, uh, for the most part. Um, but uh, in this case, they are, they are hanging judges because they know in part, that's their job because the colony is at risk from, from this, this threat, right? Um, and even more so, though, the judges managed to turn legal precedent really on its head. Because before 1692, if you confess to witchcraft, usually, again, after some form of torture, um, you would be executed, tried, convicted, based on your testimony. You confessed. You're a witch. Um, and as recently as 1688, a woman, had, Goody Glover, had been executed in Boston after confessing to being a witch. In her case, her, re probably her biggest crime was being an Irish Catholic. Um, and she was an older woman who probably didn't speak English. And I suspect, uh, even when she confessed, um, they had, they asked, they, they had a, a group of doctors ask, sit down with her and interview her like, to make sure she was of sound mind. Because again, why would you confess to being a witch if they were going to execute you? And I think, again, in this case, she probably, being... Irish and probably only speaking Gaelic, probably suffered from a really bad interpreter. So, for example, they'd say, okay, do you, do you worship any, anyone other than God? Well, I venerate the saints. Ooh, really? No. So things like that, I think, probably led to, to her death. But the point is, as recently as four years before Salem, someone had been executed for witchcraft after confessing. Um, the weirdness of this is that in 1692, only those who refused confess ultimately died. Um, over a third of the people who were accused of witchcraft and charged live. 55 people out of 156. Um, and um, the court of Oyer and Terminer tried 28 people. All are found guilty and sentenced to death. The last three or four, see what happens is when people confess, they want them to spread the circle. Okay. Oh, there were 200 people when we gathered there with Satan in the field. Okay, who was there? Right, so they keep them alive to get that evidence. By the end of August, after, you know, they, when they were beginning to run out of people, so in the September trials, they do start going to the people who confessed. I'm convinced if the trials had lasted longer than like October, if Governor Phipps hadn't ended the trials after his wife was accused, that there would have probably been confessed people who died. But the reality of it is, no one who confessed died in 1692. Again, it's kind of, it's, to me, it's the most disturbing fact of, of, it, of it all. Um, so why did the judges, though, accept these verdicts and, 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 the, you know, and, and also these, these uh, uh, confessions? Well, you have to look at these judges. Interesting group, nine of them. They're the wealth, some of the wealthiest merchants in the colony. Under the new charter of 1691, they've all been named to the governor's council. Today, that would make them state senators. Um, they, in that role in the council, they've passed orders calling for um, an order for moral reformation, calling for, you know, uh, uh, more, more students have to be back in school because in school that's where we go to learn the Bible and we need people back, back in the meeting house to attend worship and we need to drive Satan from our colony by going for this campaign of, of pure, strict Puritanism and moral purity, right? And, and the judges are in the lead on this. Um, none of them are ministers, um, but a majority of them had attended Harvard. Um, so they're well-trained, they're, they're educated folk, and um, they're all related. Six of the nine are related by marriage, um, and the sheriff of Essex County is the, their nephew. Now, 
Working for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, I can make all kinds of jokes about nephews of legislators who are contractors, but I won't. Um, but I'll just say, it seems to me things have not changed an awful lot in 325 years or so. Um, but, so you, but the point is, more important is, these people are not only of the same group and the same mind, and the same interest, they are related. And also, too, they, they, uh, Judge Stoughton, who's the chief judge of the court, they're, I think they're, they're, they tend to be very deferential to. He's also the deputy governor of the colony. So if he, and he's convinced that these people are witches. Um, he's upset when the trials come to an end. He wants to hang them more, for sure. Um, so they're all going along, I think, with him. And it's in their best interest to, to, to do so. Um, but also, too, back to the war. Um, and again, it really looked in 1692 that the, the agents, pardon me, but what the Puritans saw as the agents of Satan, uh, again, laughable to us, but the French Catholics, the, where they would consider minions of the Pope, and the Native Americans who were pagans, and unless they had converted to Catholicism, which some had, which might have even been worse, perhaps, in the Puritans' eyes, um, you have these, the combined forces, the enemies of the Puritans, uh, who are tr driving the colony back into the sea, Maine has been almost completely abandoned, and then New Hampshire and Massachusetts will be next. And in the summer of 1692, people are in such a panic in Gloucester that they're convinced that there's phantom attacks by, by French soldiers. They weren't, but they thought there was. Um, and, well, here's the point, folks. Who's running this war anyhow? Well, it happens to be the judges and, other, and their, their, their other merchants. Most of the judges are high-ranking military officers. Colonel Waite Winthrop, one of the nine judges, is actually commander-in-chief of this army that is losing this war um, and uh, they have responsibilities. The Essex County Militia is fighting up in Maine and not doing particularly well. These guys also are speculators on frontier lands. They own, they own four sawmills, thousands of acres of land throughout the region. Um, and so uh, here's the thing folks, human nature I fear far too often it is for us to like blame ourselves or not blame ourselves but to blame someone else and scapegoat them for our problems. Think in 1692, the judges who've lost lots, right? Who are they gonna get angry at? Who are gonna, we can blame the government, they haven't protected our mill. Oh wait, that's us. No, 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 it's the military. Oh wait, that's us too. And again, you know, well as Dana Carvey says, it's much easier to blame someone else, you know, as Dana says, could it be Satan, right? Yeah, again, and so they look outward for the witches, not inward in, in owning some of the responsibility, all right. Um, let me just see if I can wrap this up. So, questioning of the trials grows throughout the fall of 1692. Um, Cotton Mather does write this book uh, really to sort of put an end to it. He's really a spin doctor. It's a, it's a horrible book that discredits him and the Puritan cause. Basically says no innocent lives were lost and only looks at a couple of cases of the, of the most obvious. Um, it's really a whitewash to cover the government because the government can't acknowledge that they've, they've killed innocent people because that really would be the end of the Puritan colony in Massachusetts and you might have Edmund Andrus coming back or something worse. Um, so as soon as the book's published, Phipps packages it up, writes a letter to the Crown and saying, by the way, we've had this little problem with witches and we've been busy, but don't worry, no innocent lives have been lost. And here's the wonderful Cotton Mather who wrote his book saying that that happened. So we don't need any more books written, do we? So I'm issued a publication ban because we really don't need people talking about this uh, at all. It will be an inextinguishable flame. Uh, so, I, I, you know, um, the, 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 it's the first large-scale government cup in American history, you know, well before Watergate, well before Nixon. Um, and the publication ban actually lasts three years. But here's the thing, when it's broken, people refuse to let the story die. Thomas Mull um, writes a book in 1695. He's arrested for a seditious libel, um, essentially for treason, and, um, in the trial, amazingly enough, he's, this, this Quaker, again, this really outsider, is found not guilty. And it's really seen in, in many circles as the beginnings of freedom of speech, freedom of press, and freedom of religion in American jur jurisprudence. Um, and this really sort of changed the tide. Other books follow, and in fact, the relatives refuse to forget either because they're filing petition for redress of grievance, for restoration of innocency, until 1749. Over 50 years after the trials, they will not let this die. They'll, they will not let the injustice die. And the Massachusetts legislature, the great and general court, is regularly debating this issue for over 50 years. And of course, uh, most recently, we've had about a half dozen folks, actually the last, last convicted witch is pardoned uh, in the second half of the, of the 20th century and early 21st century. Um, 2022, the last, the last one who had not been pardoned, Elizabeth Johnson Jr. was was actually pardoned. So it's been an ongoing matter that people have just refused to let die. And I think again too, that's why Salem's the witch city, right? Um, 
And Salem, too, still has this, this real kind of shame for this event. They refused to build a memorial until the 300th anniversary in 1992. Um, and uh, because people were still embarrassed by it, they didn't want to acknowledge it, um, and they finally owned up after 300 years. And um, I uh, actually was one of the people who, who uh, was on the Gallows Hill team who um, confirmed the execution site back in 2016, which um, was just a, an amazing story to be a part of. Uh, um, we, we sent out a press release Monday morning, and by Wednesday I was on Fox News nationally, and my daughter texts me from college and says, hey, Dad, you and Gallows Hill are trending on Facebook. I said, like, well, but it was a strong, and people kept on contact and saying, thank you for doing this. This is important to me. This is unfinished business. I'm the ninth great grandson, the 10th the great granddaughter of, and we're coming, let us know when you're going to dedicate that memorial. And I, and I, I like to point out, and it's really funny, this was named. <laughs> This was this was named by Archaeology Magazine as the ten one of the ten top archaeological discoveries of 2016. And I'm going like, we didn't discover anything. The actual people had never lost pr track of the site. The pro property was known as Proctor's Ledge, owned by John Proctor's grandson and his descendants until the late 19th century. I think they knew where Grandpa died. Um, and even in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, a local historian, um, Sidney Perley, identified the site in an article in 1902. But the town didn't want to accept it. And there'd be an article in the paper saying, and then 10 years later, it's like, yeah, no. Um, so, um, but amazingly, the town had actually purchased the property um, back in the 1930s, but had refused to put a memorial there. So here we are at the, the dedication ceremony in 2017. So, just to conclude. So, People always say, how could people be so dumb and superstitious? Well, first off, they're not superstitious. Witches are real. They're in the Bible. And they're not dumb. They're as smart as we are. But think about this. They know witches are in their midst. And they know the witches' goals is to destroy, destroy their society, destroy their religion, destroy their government, wipe them out. And they don't even have to be here to do it. They could be in Boston and still do it, right? Um, or Quebec. Uh, and it's impossible to tell who they are. It could be any one of you. Could be me. We all could be witches for that matter and not know it. Um, so here's the problem. How do you stop something like that? Well, the government's working on it. Well, the, the government, how, what are they going to do? Do they know any better than us? Well, simply folks, if you swap the word witches in 1692 with terrorists today, I think you understand the problem they faced. Again, like, I'm not, expect, I'm not looking out there looking out for terrorists today, but if a series of bad things start to happen around here, like large explosions and fireworks and all this stuff going off, all of a sudden, you, you can pretty quickly go to a pretty bad spot, right? Especially, you know, big, sometimes you're in a big city. You've been in, like, Manhattan or Boston when you hear, like, an explosion or a fire or sirens. And initially, you don't know, no, come on, you know, oh, dear, I hope someone's okay. They're okay. But, you know, the mind starts taking you there pretty quickly. And that's the problem back then, too, right? They knew because witches are always there. But only occasionally do they really try to take over. Yeah. So, anyhow, I've spoken far too long, but thank you. Happy to answer questions, and yes, I have, I have, I have uh, books I'm happy to sell, or if you brought copies, I'll sign them too. Thank you very much. Any questions? I have a question. All right. So are you seeing in um, the different countries that had big outbreaks too, was that also predominantly female yes. being accused? So it's yeah, absolutely, Sharon. I, 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 pretty much everywhere witchcraft accusations take place. Again, the, the percentages may vary a little bit. It's really it's amazing, pretty close to about three, in Salem, right, right around that target, about three quarters of the people accused are women. And this, again, through, through time and, and space. We initially, years ago, it sounded like Russia might have not fit the pattern. Uh, there was more, a lot more men, but then we realized they hadn't studied enough. And when someone did a big book, they said, oh yeah, it's just about the same. So that seems to be kind of a, Pretty universal pattern, no matter where you are, not just, not just here, yeah, yeah. And not just amongst Puritans or Englishmen, it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. What parallels do you see to what's happening now? <sighs> well, I see way too many parallels. Um, and I wasn't sure I believed them until about five or six years ago, and my wife, who, who basically has put up with me for over 40 years and is, is not particularly interested in history, said, after the news one, I said, God, it's just like Salem, isn't it? Um, you know, it, it really, I think to me, you know, there's so many ways of, of, of looking at this. Um, but I guess, to me, some ways it comes down to um, this, this tendency to look for scapegoats and for look to people to say, say you're responsible for your problems. Um, and also the fact then is now is to demonize your enemies. And, you know, I think that's, 
that's just a major problem that we all face no matter where we are in, in politics or society. We tend to get in our bubbles where we only use the channels of social media and TV that we're used to and all the people in our bubbles and we, if they post something we like it and if we post something outrageous they like it um, and we don't think about the people who might have a difference of opinion. And I, to me, the, the most disturbing part about this really is, is that if you look at, you know, um, I think, you know, most Americans, I think if you sit down with someone who you disagree with politically over a cup of coffee, you'd find that you agree about 95% on everything, right? We really do as to what's really important as, 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 as far as our freedoms, as far as your, 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 your family and your neighbors uh, and that sort of stuff. But somehow that gets lost because we just wanted, we, we, we got in a stage where we just really want to make our enemies into the devil, you know? So um, I could go on on that for hours and I, I won't because I, I really do try to keep this relatively apolitical, but I will say that uh, the parallels are, to me, are, are really scary and I don't pretend to have any easy, easy answer, but I will say, I find myself more and more involved. When I get interested in this, I get interested in it as a historian because historians are really interested in time periods that see change. And witchcraft is really an element, uh, an evidence of change and weird things happening in society, stresses. And so I get interested in it from that point. And only, only in, even though I, I found out along the way that I was, you know, I had an ancestor who was involved um, and, and died, um, I didn't realize how serious this was to people, how much it meant to people um, the, the, the efforts to like to pardon and, and really for restorative justice uh, and, and, and how big an issue that was and, I be, and I be, to me I became, I become much more involved working with groups that are, that are trying to do pardoning. Right now I'm working with a group that's trying to get all of the people who were convicted of witchcraft in Massachusetts pardoned, not just the ones in Salem. And, and people will sort of, and I had a very peripheral role in the Elizabeth Johnson exoneration case basically. Ironically I wasn't directly involved but the the Times and the New York Times both said, oh, we need a quote from you on this. And I'm going like, no, 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 you need to talk to these other people. But when they asked me about that, what I said, I said, you know, look, we put these people through hell. Um, Elizabeth Johnson Jr., like over 30 members of her, almost 30 members of her family were accused in the witch trials. Um, and I, I think the least we could do now is say, oh, we're sorry, right? You know, it's not, not too tough. And, I, and, I, and I, so I, 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 um, I really feel that, the, that, these, that there's, there's lessons here. That we that we can we can uh, use, and particularly I work uh, oftentimes in in Salem with uh, in, when they made the memorial in, in, in the 300th anniversary. There was a group called um, the Salem Award Foundation was created, and every year they give a, a, an award uh, to a champion of social justice in in honor of the victims of the witch trials. Um, they've changed their name now; they're now called Voices Against Injustice. Um, but you know, groups like that and the work they do to try to make people aware. Uh, of these kinds of issues around the world. Um, the fact that there are parts of the world today in parts of India and, and Africa where mobs are still murdering people as witches. Illegal mobs will come, again, there's crop failure or something going wrong in the village, they scapegoat somebody, some old man, some old woman, they, they drag them out, they tie their hands behind their backs, they put a, a tire over their heads, they pour gasoline on them and set them on fire. It's horrific. So these are, these are it, it's, it's, it's a really very much a live issue and relevance. And again, like I, I'm afraid as long as we have things like, you know, hatreds and, 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 and bigotries and racisms, we are going to have some form of scapegoating and some form of witchcraft. You know, I'm, that's my ultimate takeaway. And, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry it's not a happy ending, but maybe it's something at least to, yeah, but I will say this too. I am actually working now on a book on the aftermath, which again, maybe has a happier ending because again it looks at issues of restorative justice right it, it, it looks at transgenerational trauma how these families were affected this by this by generations it looks at collective amnesia oh oh we're going by this hill but it called gallows hill but you know nothing happened there no not at all you know um, so really try to look at, at how Salem's history has been shaped in the nation on the wake of the witch trials from like 1693 to present so you know, that was a really long answer to your question I'm sorry <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you very much. My pleasure.